and finally I mean, you have done scr so what is the career that you see in this area so uh, my intent of scr was also to look at how it is impacting uh, my current role and this is how it triggered the interest of your you doing scr now since you already had joined investment banking somebody who is not from investment banking and want to start what skill set you should develop now all of these questions that i'm asking is for uh, either a student or a young professional who is there in the industry uh, what is the skill set that is needed when you're moving across the division what do people senior management actually look in you before what they look into you is purely what is that you should also look out for okay you said compliance so if anybody is looking out for a career in investment bank is there any regulation that they can learn or they can read about more throughout your journey you have been taking so many interviews so i want to understand what mistakes people do when they come to the interview i generally would receive on an average 300 to 400 cvs for wow. one role even they, they are using more space for design than and less space for content right? okay with respect to when you are when you are trying to make a career in investment bank what are few do's and few don'ts as per your experience that hello guys hi this is ganesh naik i'm back with one such podcast for you guys so that i can help you in your career in finance and today we have with us nataraj he is going to be talking to us about his journey into the investment banking and lot of queries he is going to address which students or young people in finance right now have so nataraj thank you very much for joining us thank you sir and for the audience if you could tell us what has been your background in the industry sure uh, so my name is nataraj korgaukar I've been in the investment banking industry for the last 18 odd years mm-hmm. um but before getting into investment banking again i completed my education in management studies uh which was a graduation course and then i got into my investment banking role okay um the first role that i got into was into private banking operations okay where uh, we were catering to high net worth individuals and because the role was of operations my pure duty were related to uh, you know conducting uh, private banking operation activities such as reconciliations glrs that is okay. general ledger yeah. reconciliation and substantiation then we did some sox audits okay and thereafter within the same uh, company i moved into another role where i was looking at uh, you know hnis and super H, uh, SDI, which is self-directed investors. Okay. So these are basically the two type of uh, you know customers or clients that you would have in a private banking uh, you know setup. Uh, setup. So there we were looking at their fee schedules, fee structures. How do we charge clients? Okay. Uh, for asset under management, which is uh, the portfolio that they have with us, and we mm. manage. We as a bank manage that portfolio. Okay. Or it is a SDI that is self-directed investor client, where uh, predominantly they take the decisions of investment. We only hold custody of assets. So, okay. depending upon the uh, investment category of that particular client, the fee schedules were charged uh, or was set up, and that was the operational role that I was doing. So that's that's the start of my career. So this I, is only operations part, right? Okay, right. and uh, so. spent almost 5 years in that mnc uh, the first time and then moved into another uh, mnc bank where i was then i transitioned from operations into finance okay where i was doing uh, fpn financial planning and analysis right for a technology business of that bank right uh, so banks would always have various businesses so this is purely catering to the technology Mm-hmm. so when they were let's say setting up a data center or when they were procuring um, various uh, you know instruments systems. that are systems that are required for their technology built up mm-hmm. uh, we would do the financial planning and analysis which means uh, budgeting for uh, all okay. the infrastructure and the expansion plans then forecasting what is going to be the revenue what's going to be the cost Okay. EBIT analysis basically okay. earning before interest and taxes. So from a business perspective as well, even though it is internal, but every business would actually want to look at their profitability. Uh, you know, 
from various aspects and we would do it for a business level for product level for data centers so that was the role and one question over here so it was a part of the finance team itself the fpna team and within that you were only looking at one vertical is it correct, correct. that's okay. right okay so yeah I, we were part of the fpna organization and within that i was catering to the technology business okay perfect and then you move from so yeah so there uh, you know i was there for about couple of years and then the next role within the same bank was for management reporting so management reporting is a different ball game altogether uh, here we were looking at pnl at a product level at a desk level we were looking at cost pool okay. uh, revenue allocation and so on. so various uh, finance and reporting related functions put together okay. to help uh, management look at let's say which product is making business sense which uh, desk is uh, actually having a lot of pnl errors so and so forth and this was purely for the uh, india sri lanka bangladesh operations of that bank and this is again a part of the finance team itself is it that's right yeah okay and so over there you were working closely with the product control team also we were working with product control we were working with finance control we okay. were working with heads of business okay. uh, to kind of give them their uh, monthly uh, pnl analysis mm -hmm. for management report wonderful and then from this role so yeah i think uh, after spending almost 4 years in the finance and 5 years in operations i moved into the risk role uh, with another mnc bank uh, this was this time it was a european mnc bank and uh, and i also moved city so my first 9 years were in uh, mumbai and then i moved into bangalore mm. uh, where i was looking at uh, treasury risk reporting Okay. so purely i was supporting the uh, wholesale loan operation business uh, of that bank okay. um, and let's say even for a loan when the bank has to remit the fund to a borrower they need to get that money internally from somebody else like right. treasury has the control of all the funds right so my role was to be that mediator between treasury and the loan operations mm. to look at uh, cost of borrowing cost of funding if uh, if the borrower has paid the money and it's sitting on the nostro account nostro account is basically where the funds are actually received yes. from the clients or the borrowers so my role was to ensure that the funds are not lying on that account but they are again placed back to the treasury so that the treasury does not charge the loan operations team okay. a specific cost so basically um, every, treasury will always charge all the businesses uh, of a bank a specific internal cost right and that cost needs right. to be managed so that is the role that i i was purely in. just a point so for students who are who are doing frm level 2 there is a chapter called liquidity transfer pricing yes. explicitly talking about the role exactly right so this yes this was related to the liquidity transfer pricing but um, when we talk about liquidity transfer pricing we are, here we are looking at uh, let's say an associated party hmm. right let's say or a subsidiary of a of a same bank right but the role that i was into we were within the same subsidiary so the treasury uh, of a particular uh, subsidiary that i was part of they also had the loan operations of the okay. same subsidiary and so it was more internal internal, internal teams itself and you were providing right. liquidity to that team okay and you are basically hitting their cost center some charge that's it okay yeah. and and helping them to stay uh, pnl positive so that was the role so unfortunately uh, you know that bank was also in a very uh, turmoil state at that moment so i decided to come back to uh, the first bank where i was mm. working and there uh, i really got a great opportunity i was working in market risk okay and um, my role there was so a little background of the role uh, 2008 we had the financial crisis mm -hmm. based on the financial crisis various regulators came up with the ccar report which is right. the comprehensive capital analysis and review now the, this report has various schedules um schedule a schedule b schedule c so and so forth mm -hmm. so i was part i was responsible for schedule f which is on the trading books which is purely the market risk side and these uh, this schedule f had around 26 odd sub schedule so uh -huh. which catered to all almost all the products so right from let's say munis to sovereign bonds to um, 
uh, rates, uh, then you had equities, you mm-hmm. had global equities, you had uh, um, uh, you had commodities, uh, derivatives. So all these products are reported to regulators mm-hmm. on a quarterly basis. And my role was uh, so there's a there's a team that is responsible for uh, you know reporting these numbers. Okay, it's called the market risk coverage team. Okay, and my role there was uh, just mimic what they do to check. Uh, so basically, it's all about uh, giving a comfort to the internal uh, stress team or a risk team that the numbers that are being reported to the regulators are complete and accurate. So okay. it was purely performing a secondary review on these reports that would go out. So it started with that one CCA report. Then we expanded to Walker report. We expanded mm-hmm. to a couple of other market risk reports. Mm-hmm. And then internally, again, I, I took a mobility to uh, take care of credit risk reporting. Okay. So within credit risk, we were looking at uh, uh, the top 50, which means institution to institution, what's the credit exposures. Uh, you know, and a couple of other reports that, that would go out. Okay. Uh, so that was the overall, uh, uh, you know, uh, first two, two and a half years in that role. And again, I took a mobility uh, internally uh, and I came to Mumbai from Bangalore. And here I was looking at limit risk reporting. So okay. limits are basically the innovation, you know, the risk appetite of a particular branch or mm-hmm. a particular desk. Uh, and then aggregated at a total business level and bank level. Uh, there are certain limits, which means mm. uh, border cases or border lines, which are defined mm. for at a desk level, at a product level, at a exposure level, uh, which which helps the risk management team to understand. Okay, where let's say what is DVO one today for a particular desk on a, on a set of equities. Okay. Or let's say how much of uh, mutual funds uh, uh, exposure we have today or how much of hedge fund exposure we have today okay right mtm values of those uh, products uh, and these limits are defined and if let's say a trader does uh, execute a trade because of which any one of these limits are breach, uh, breach then it comes to me and uh, we we identify the breach we invest we work with the coverage we uh, work with the coverage team and a couple of other uh, uh, trading teams to kind of understand uh, why these breaches have took place. Okay. Uh, they could be defined either it is a valid breach or an invalid breach. Mm-hmm. Invalid could be purely uh, due to let's say a timing difference or cup, uh, system issues or so and so forth. Right. And if there are valid breaches, then business will provide a justification why did they took that exposure or conducted that trade. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, mitigation actions would come in play and, you know, people responsible for it would either hedge uh, that specific trade or, you know, square it off and, you know, come back to the or below the below the limits. And this was purely the market risk side only. Right. Right. So we are looking at the option Greek related limits also. Not the credit one. Yeah. Yeah. This is market risk. Okay. So we, we used to look at 10K, 10QR as well. We used to look at daily VAR, mm. uh, 1% uh, or 99% the way you would say. Okay. Right. We would look at 95% VAR. And uh, there there was another parallel team who would also do back testing. So we would liaise with okay. them to to check if, uh, you know, if the back testing is within the permissible limits. Right. So all of these were part of under the same uh, management, but it was a very... Uh, interesting and exciting uh, avenue to kind of you know while and this is the time when i was actually doing my firm level one uh, sorry level two yeah so it was very interesting to kind of learn what you're doing and also execute the same in the room so from liquidity to operation uh, market risk you moved yes entirely yeah and then from there so from then uh, in the last three years i'm looking at uh, operation risk Within operation risk, there's a, there was a slight element of climate risk in some of the uh, activities that I was involved in. Mm-hmm. So in 2021, um, I moved to another uh, MNC bank, mm-hmm. uh, this time based in Hyderabad. And uh, I look at uh, something that we uh, that we learned in operation risk in part two, which is RCSA, risk and, con- risk, con- risk and control self-assessment. 
right so based on that activity there is a program device to test controls mm. to check if uh, and this is part of the first line of defense right. so to check whether the controls that are there with the business are they uh, you know are they strong or in in the in the language that we use is are they effective are they is, is the design correct is the design correct right so we would do test of design control testing basically exactly so control testing uh there i was leading a team and uh, one of the uh, business that i was uh, taking care of was on the commercial real estate side mm. which included uh flood and disaster protection act related controls okay so that is where the climate risk kind of you know kicked in a bit so basically in the us they've got flood and uh, flood disaster protection act basis which banks have to check specific controls if they are giving any uh, loans or mortgages to commercial properties or okay home properties and uh, we were testing those and again i'm i'm not getting into detail but this is at a very high level so we would test those controls to check if they are uh, working effective or not right and this is how you triggered the interest of your you doing scr uh, climate risk uh, actually triggered when i was uh, and i was working with uh an mnc bank and i was included in the risk appetite aggregation mm -hmm. exercise it was a one time exercise uh but that's where uh you know i was providing inputs for market risk and i had a person who was you know giving inputs for climate risk mm. and i had never heard about that term till 2018 and i was very interested okay. to you know what is this so that's how it all triggered in um so while i was performing that role uh i started to look out on google and internet like what is climate risk and you know what, what are the things that the financial industry is doing around it i yeah. came across some uh, uh and back then tcfd which was task force yeah. for climate related financial disclosures i came across that and i started to appear for some of their free uh you know exams or certifications right and when i completed that that's where i got an understanding okay this these are the things that are involved in climate risk uh, some of the mnc banks uh, have climate risk under strategy risk some mm -hmm. of them have it under op operational risk so at at my current uh, you know place where i'm working we have it embedded in under operational risk okay okay so wide experience starting from ops to your finance and then moving to risk itself so now for now all of these questions that i'm asking is for uh, either a student or a young professional who is there in the industry what is the uh, what is the skill set that is needed when you're moving across the division what do people senior management actually look in you right um so okay let let me start before what they look into you is uh, purely what is that you should also look out for okay um so for example you uh, one may look out for uh, you know a diversified uh, you know career mm -hmm. but that also comes with a cost so there's something that i learned uh, during my career that you know career initially uh, during let's say apparent age was a, a let's say i shaped career which means people would work in a particular bank or particular uh, let's say the pharma company and they would only work in the same vertical for 20 25 years right right over a period that narrative changed to a t shaped career so people would work across various divisions or various roles for a period but they would pick up one role or one division and then continue or continue uh, growing yeah that. continue to grow in that i think nowadays the narrative that i've heard is something called as v shape uh, uh, or a diamond shape which is like you you try to go as deep in that particular uh, uh, in that particular role or that particular uh, function uh, as long as you are and then you try to move so you basically end up uh, you know having a v shape where at least there'll be some some portion let's say you may spend 5 or 7 years in market risk but you may spend 3 years in credit risk you may spend let's say 1 year in op risk so you okay. get a you know diamond shape or a v shape kind of a uh, uh, so that's the terminology that i heard for the first time so i'm okay my 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 thoughts are for students and professionals um it's good to kind of you know uh, first make up your own mind mm. what do you, what do you really want to do and in today's era it is absolutely fine 
to to say that hey you know what the decision that i took is not right or it is right okay. and i'm loving it if you think it's not right then then start looking at okay what is the option okay. and i think that's the starting point the moment you look at the options available let's say someone who is in operations hmm. and wants to get into risk right the the way to do it is one through education hmm. that is the primary so education means you either do some certification courses or every uh mnc would have their own internal learning and development pick up some courses there uh talk to people understand what it is understand okay. concepts and then that's where you you get a little feel okay this is where it is now the question that you again ask what do hiring managers look out for actually hiring managers look out more for uh the soft skill than the hard skills or the core yes the core is important the the fundamentals are are important but i've seen time and again that opportunities are given to people who've not done that specific role okay. but they have a thirst for it but they have a, an attitude and an approach that says okay i may not know the answer but if i have a question i will at least find out and work towards it to get an answer and see what is the solution or what is the next step Right. so i think if you are able to depict that not just in an interview but also in course of your career then opportunities do come your way uh, to either you know go i shape like in the, in the same uh, same role go deep into it or you know look at different uh, right. verticals and businesses and the point that you mentioned uh, having the right attitude i was also doing a podcast with somebody else and he also mentioned that Uh, the attitude becomes the core whenever right. you hire somebody because and that's that is a point that the audience should also remember that uh, new people having the right attitude towards that okay i will learn i will stick to the role i learn what is happening and have that hunger is also going to make a very big difference in you getting hired in that particular role right, right? and with respect to skill set okay so now since you already had joined immersion banking somebody who is not from investment banking and want to start what skill set you should develop so um, again uh, investment banking is a wide array of opportunities and roles so let, let's start with some basics right uh, if if i if i have to break it down there there are four or five categories you will look mm-hmm. at in investment banking one is pure sales where the person is expected to know the fundamental products right how the product work which system which application rules okay. regulation so it's all on the sales side mm-hmm. but more on understanding the product so let's say if someone okay. who's uh, selling fixed income products in the market in an investment bank or uh, you know equities or any of these uh, then they should know those uh, products and then the sales right right if someone is trying to get into operations now operations again is a very a uh, huge and wide a- array of uh, roles and responsibility that come in mm-hmm. you you will have something which is called as trade life cycle right so trade life cycle means right from uh, you know i think there's there are i think eight or nine stages yes. uh, trade booking confirmation pre confirmation uh, trade then there's ex- execution settlement mm-hmm. uh, reconciliation reporting all of those right and each of those have distinct requirements but they are fungible across uh, across the entire investment banking so okay. someone who knows trade life cycle can actually work and play in any of these points okay. uh, that we just spoke about rather at uh, right from uh, you know trade booking to settlements to reporting reconciliations because all of those are interconnected so that's that's purely the operation side now again okay. within this one may be only focusing on equities one may be only focusing on let's say fixed income structured products so dip, depending upon the product so product knowledge again if you look at it uh, becomes the core of it okay uh, so this is on the operations the third let's say somebody looks at finance hmm. now finance means uh, you know someone who understands financial statement analysis and again there are there is there's a different uh, you know uh, wide scope in finance uh, finance also includes re- uh, valuations mm-hmm. finance also includes accounting finance also includes 
product knowledge so someone who has these uh, skill sets or uh, knowledge would right. actually gain a lot we, if you move into risk risk again has a bit of valuation on the vcg side right valuation control group uh, which generally looks at that uh, you have uh, you know the controllers team which is uh, right from control testing to uh, co- uh, to assessing whether the numbers are complete and accurate uh, so there are there are wide ranges in, in the risk so as well so product level knowledge for each type of activity should be there right so product and the function that you you will be part of is okay. is going to be required whether you even if you are in technology you will still need let's say the product knowledge to build a technology and then the technology related basic fundamentals so i think these combinations will be will be really okay. good and just an add on point so like you said there is finance team so when you look at the trade life cycle you can also connect back to what all activity within the trade life cycle is actually finance team is doing right and you can look at that sync when you're preparing or you're aspiring to get into investment banking as an audience right yeah so um in in one of the role that i performed uh where we were charging fees to the client uh my role included to liaise with the finance team mm. so let's say if i'm charging x amount of fees uh depending upon a particular trade mm. uh so clients would have a fee schedule uh if they trade in equities up to a specific aum value depending upon tiers right mm-hmm. just like we have a income tax slab they also have a uh, you know a charges slab fee slab yeah so depending upon the tiers the amount of uh, the value of the trade that much amount of fees is charged now uh, once this fees is charged it's sitting in a particular account it is one of my team's role to move it from that account into a finance account or probably they would i mean now technology is there that they they directly pick it up Uh, so that's that's again liaising with finance so everywhere right. you will either liaise with finance or a risk or a technology or compliance as well investment bank has a lot of compliance and mm. regulatory requirements that's an upcoming um, and it will always be one of the most uh, guard uh, you know the, the first guard of uh, investment bank to kind of you know take care of compliance requirements mm-hmm. so uh, even that has a huge opportunity in terms of uh, roles and responsibilities that one person can act in okay. so just in connecting question to this you said compliance so if anybody is looking out for a career in investment bank is there any regulation that they can learn or they can read about more oh there are many i mean regulations would again depend upon the region in which that bank is operating mm-hmm. uh products and services that they are offering okay. right uh so you one cannot pinpoint at a particular uh, regulation uh, but generally in 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 the us uh, all these reg uh, regulations have you know one uh, you know alphabetic uh, suffix like reg a reg b reg c right mm-hmm. each of them are for specific purposes um, and a lot of them apply for the investment bank as a whole some of them apply for let's say the commercial bank or the retail bank some of them apply from not not just for an investment bank but any bank that deals with customer information or customer data okay. right so it all depends upon uh, what what is the touch point between the two uh, segments that is the industry which is the financial institutions or let's say insurance or okay. a commercial bank or a investment boutique firm and the second side is your customers right so depending upon the touch points uh, you know specific regulations regulations might change but learning about regulation can help you in your career yes absolutely um it, they they do help in in various ways but let's say if if someone is learning about regulation that may not help a lot in let's say a trade life cycle but might help a lot in risk management for uh let's say being compliant with a particular regulation okay okay right so do it, it's it's again uh, it's it's an end, uh, uh you know there, there there are a lot of ways in which compliance plays different roles let's say if you are simply doing an onboarding of a client mm. or a customer your kyc your due diligence has various regulatory requirements there are privacy laws there are uh you know uh, laws that that prevent mis selling so 
depending upon how that interaction is between the the industry participant and the customer various regulations can can be applied can be applied okay perfect and now uh, throughout your journey you have been taking so many interviews so i want to understand uh, top 4 for example what mistakes people do when they come to the interview uh, so the the challenge is is uh, job descriptions are most of the time generalized they are at a little higher level right uh, what what a candidate can do mm. is one uh, understand the uh, so there are a lot of details that a uh, job description will provide the industry the function or the team or you know whatever right. where where that role is currently residing uh, if even if somebody uses internet to understand the the type of uh, <coughs> you know day in the life of that particular role or the type of uh, activity that that role does that person will get at least let's say 50 60% of an uh, view of what that what role is, uh, entails right okay uh, so i think that uh, that's that's one key start the second uh, thing is uh, you know the uh, we've seen and again there are there are diverse views we've seen cvs uh, which are running four five pages we've seen cvs that run uh, you know one one and a half page as well there is no set rule right. but at least in my personal opinion what's critical is uh generally an hiring manager uh so let's say if i open a uh, if i'm hiring um i generally would receive on an average 300 to 400 cvs for wow. one role now i do not review all all of them there's a uh, a chart that right. kind of reviews them and then from there the hr will filter and send it to the hiring manager x number of let's say 15 20% of those at least right so if i talk about 300 cvs and then uh, just take yes. 20% of that 60 cvs to go for one role it's at times very difficult to actually go through all of them right a uh, lot of times people have uh, you know unwanted data or uh, information or even they, they are using more space for design than and less space for content right okay uh, so there are those things right which actually filters out mo- uh, some of these cvs uh, but the talent uh, the hr team does a good job in screening and filtering they, they mm. so so they use a lot of key keywords that are provided for that particular role and if those keywords are included in the in the resume then those are actually filtered in for a review so even we look out for keywords we look out for experience okay. we look out for uh, where that person is working uh, so a lot of factors come in play and after that again there are other things like in an interview uh, the person sometimes uh, forgets and which is fine we we had instances where the person literally was blank for few minutes and we said okay you know what that's fine we will give another attempt we we can move on to another question but you know if if that person still has some challenges then it's 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 sometimes a signal that problem probably the person is not prepared yet right right uh the i think the other thing is also uh, uh in, in again nowadays business casuals are fine yeah. but um in my opinion uh as long as you are you are comfortable with uh you know with your own self whether you wear business casuals or very formal that's fine that either way uh, you know things work but as long as you, i mean you need to just be comfortable with yourself in that interview uh, if you are if you are comfortable then the interview actually goes pretty well right um yeah and majority of the time it's 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 how they explain it's mm. it's the communication that actually plays a vital role in that 30 to 40 minute to kind of help us make a decision um so th- there is another angle right uh, so i i look at it from a way that okay people at times may or may not have english as their formal language or the first language which is fine and they may have right. a little uh, uh, you know a different way of communication or a different dialect uh, that comes in play but if you are able to explain um the let's say a product or what what function you were performing earlier or currently if you're able to explain that and related to the 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 role that you're applying mm-hmm. then i think 
those those things work pretty well okay so I, th- those 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 are my observations on okay. this the next question which uh, is slightly generic but with respect to when you are when you are trying to make a career in investment bank what are few do's and few don'ts as per your experience that you should follow you should not do uh, again uh, w- wide and generic but i'll i'll give an attempt so i think the things that i look out for are one uh, you know try to be on or before time uh, it it speaks value about your own self uh, if you are able to respect your own time you will respect people's time as well so that's one two uh, do uh, you know be yourself you don't have to you don't have to be somebody else you don't have to lie you don't have to kind of uh, you know give a false representation of something else that you are not or things that you've not done uh, and then uh, you know from 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 what i feel is uh, you know there, there's got to be a lot of grit and determination um think about it in a way that uh, you know we don't we don't need to go at 100 interviews and be successful at all of them i look at it like uh you know one has to give let's say 300 interviews and just get one job so at times you may get that on your first interview at times you may get it on your 29th interview or at times you may get it on your let's say 530th interview kind of a thing so it's all about you know just going through that process that process uh to kind of get what you what you really want to and and also at the same time uh you know nobody is forcing you to co- come and join or you know do take mm-hmm. up this role right both the parties have an option both the parties have a choice so um uh, come with that mindset uh because okay. then that helps a lot uh if i i've seen uh candidates that have re- that we've rejected but we've been in touch and we've you know uh we've developed a professional healthy relationship uh and there's a good amount of you know coaching mentoring that takes place and that candidate has today you know done really well and we've also seen the other way right where people whom we've selected probably have not done that well so it's it's both the sides right and there are people who've done really well as well so that uh, you know all these combinations uh of people you see so if i have to think about it the do's is just just come with a clean uh, positive thought uh, thought process or mind right and just you know give your 100% and let the process take take care of it and finally i mean you have done scr so what is the c- career that you see in this area so um, my intent of scr was also to look at how it is impacting uh, my current role um which is uh, taking care of business risk Mm. so i see a huge impact there uh, from a from a career perspective but at the same time i think uh, i i have a very different view scr or climate change climate risk is is not just a career for one person it is some it is impacting all the 8 billion people on the planet so everybody should kind of you know take keen interest to understand what is what's happening why why, why there are let's say uh, heat waves in in the country why another country which is uh, you know always uh, in in a desert area having a hot and yeah. arid climate having floods so i think these things are impacting each and every one mm-hmm. irrespective whether the person is let's say street vendor or someone who goes to a bank and everybody should get uh, or learn and see what we can do about it right uh, and scr at the end of the day uh, also tells you what are the steps that one can take mm. to to be carbon neutral to be net zero or work towards in that uh, in whichever organization that they are working in so i think that is that's my intent of looking at it and uh, yeah i think there are opportunities huge opportunities uh, that come across uh, once you learn any new certification right um, even uh, what my what, what i've noticed is corporates like people when they upskill themselves mm. uh um, if if you bring a different perspective let's say even someone who's doing t- working in technology but uh does sustainability climate risk uh certification would think about hey how much power is this machine consuming right. which is actually generating emissions right 
can that person think in those lines it, it has nothing to do with can uh, you know will the person move from technology to a sustainability That's climate right. role but uh, how can one be sustainable and you know think about the nature and the climate in their existing role is also equally important and that's the perspective that i carry wonderful wonderful and thank you very much for taking out time and talking to us and giving a perspective on your career and different roles that you have done what in career you should be doing what is in interview you should not be doing so all of this is definitely going to be really helpful for all the new people who are planning to enter into finance or already working with one or two years of experience so thank you very much natraj for taking out time thank you thank you sir